Okay, so some uh, little reflections uh, tagging along on this series that um, a scholar who's doing some online videos uh, apparently on an initial reading of Being in Time, uh, Daniel Bonovic. Uh, I don't know, but my impression is, he doesn't say, but my impression is that he's reading uh, Being in Time for the first time uh, on the basis of uh, being a scholar of uh, the Western tradition who has uh, gone uh, a good scholar of uh, Plato in a uh, bodily palpable way more than in a um, text, uh, close textual way. In other words, what I mean to say is that his interest is uh, in trying to see what was Socrates uh, looking at, what did he think, what was it is uh, creating a, um, an imagined or uh, notional view of uh, Socrates, of Plato, of the, uh, dis the people discoursing and what were they uh, really talking about rather than um, doing uh, something more broad like um, uh, the Prussian scholars do, like uh, you get into Strauss or a, a Vogelin where you really look at the text, where you look at everything going on in Athenian society, where you look at um, uh, all kinds of close text, um, hints in the text at a very um, close level, but I think what he does is, is uh, instructive in that he just looks at a few big uh, metaphysical concepts and says, what's the um, tangible core of this and how can I look at reality through that lens and how does it, um, uh, it's sort of what we get the big criticism of from um, the traditional view of how we should study Plato, which is that um, the traditional view is that there's modern philosophy, um, British uh, analysis or analytic philosophy, and a few other things, and those are now in power and everything else is um, an antique, and uh, we don't need to follow the caravansary back into all the um, uh, dust of the past, the museum, but uh, a few things are still alive and then we'll look at those. So it's, I think bon, uh, Bonovic is kind of from that tradition um, and therefore he's never even, he hasn't gotten to Heidegger until now. Uh, but it's interesting to see um, what somebody who has that kind of bent uh, towards the secure and concrete uh, kernels within the whole uh, history of the West uh, thinks when he makes this initial reading of being a time as he seems to be doing and then he's coming out with these little um, uh, periodic uh, dispatches um, there's three days between the um, the current one and the, the last one so the, or the first one so in the first one um, I think it's instructive because uh, you notice uh, how extremely uh, vague um, Zeinen Zeit uh, 1927 is, that it's uh, remembered that there's been a large number of commentaries by uh, competent people. Um, I knew uh, Dreyfus, Hubert Dreyfus, personally, um, and he's one of the ones that uh, I think most of the people that are a little bit super subtle sense of... Um, what's really good in Heidegger, uh, despised Dreyfus. Um, um, and I think the more one is a neophyte, the more one tends to uh, despise anything that isn't either uh, bona fide in the sense that it's been authorized by a great philosopher who one uh, wants to somehow identify oneself with. And... Um, uh, while I still subscribe to that side in the sense that, yes, there are uh, very few great philosophers, yes, we should have very high standards, at the other hand, um, I think also um, from Strauss, who has those standards, um, we see that we can look at uh, what anyone uh, thinks about it, and there can be we can get an instruction from that. 
Uh, so, and uh, some of these people aren't just anyone, but Bonovic is somebody who's been studying Plato and studying uh, Aristotle and studying uh, Locke and uh, so forth, studying the tradition. And then you say, what do they make when they uh, read these texts? And how is it that these, um, this forced text of Heidegger's being in time, who, which he's forced to um, produce in order to um, secure um, full professorship, um, publish or perish, as they say now. Uh, what's wrong with this text that it's so open to n number of interpretations and not just among uh, people who are careless, but um, among people who are uh, steeped in the tradition that Heidegger is steeped in. Uh, so the thing that struck me, first of all, is the immediately uh, he's uh, saying that there's Heidegger is associating Dasein with consciousness. So I think that's one thing that I want to uh, try to clarify in terms of uh, I cannot clarify it uh, rigorously right now because I have to review a great lot of material, but I only want to signal how many what the issues are involved. So if you uh, consider just, let's say, going... Uh, one thing, we have two words for consciousness where the ancients and uh, most people in the tradition uh, did not have two words. Um, uh, conscious consciousness as uh, the bare consciousness and uh, conscience, conscious, which we call moral conscience. Uh, that's an English language thing. Uh, in German, you have Bewusstsein and uh, Gewissen, kind of like that. Um, but uh, in Greek, you do not have that split. Um, and in the tradition on the whole, there's this working out of it. You have in Aquinas, 13th century, you have the syndiasis and these other uh, uh, concepts which correspond in some way to the Greek language being worked out. So that uh, what I want to say there is the vagueness uh, has something to do with the develop with the we could call it provisionally evolution of. Um, consciousness as language consciousness as language holds our thoughts because uh, it's not obvious that there should be this distinction between um, awareness of uh, good and bad put into this notion of conscience or um, con naturality or something like that um, as uh, knowing where Scientia, scientia, conscience, conscience, in that sense, is supposed to be uh, somehow a secure knowing. And uh, this other uh, broad notion, which uh, there's all kinds of um, difficulties in working out the whole history of that, and there's no, um, there's nobody who we could just simply rely on to do that. So then you have to ha study it for. Uh, decades and look through everything and then uh, I mean you see all I mean I point out a couple things like that uh, this great essay by um, uh, William James where he uh, goes into the uh, change around um, 1900 I think the essays are written around 1900 or so where he's talking about the change from uh, psychology platonic psychology uh, suke soul um, analysis to giving up the complexity of that and just uh, going over to this consciousness notion, which is um, uh, very vague and um, has something to do with the question of uh, perception, which uh, doesn't play uh, the same role in um, the Greeks that it does uh, after Kant. Um, or may possibly after Leibniz, but um, so 
consciousness, uh, what is Bonovic thinking when he says uh, Dasein is being identified with consciousness? He's not plain about that. He says uh, there's some different factors we have to look at. We have to be careful as we go along in the reading. Um, he's aware that there's this uh, super subtle uh, uh, vagueness problem here. Uh, what would consciousness mean uh, if we're speaking of it just directly? It means the same thing as that the world is here. So actually, in a certain sense, so far as we can't distinguish it from anything, it would seem to be a totally empty uh, concept. Um, we think that we can distinguish it in some way from being knocked out, physically knocked out and, and going unconscious. Like... Um, a football player being uh, given a concussion, for instance. Uh, but can we actually do that? Only um, in an imaginary way. In other words, only by projecting onto the person that's gone unconscious the state of being unconscious. But what we really mean is that they can no longer, um, we can no longer communicate with us. They can't hear us, they're unconscious. But this is um, imagining the state of someone else. Uh, likewise, uh, we have this notion of a deep, uh, dreamless sleep, which would seem to be um, uh, just an abyss uh, which has no consciousness to it. Sometimes uh, in mystic, mystics give us uh, um, some report of such a uh, reality which would seemingly be in contradistinction to consciousness, but where then one might think consciousness means, again, the same as the world, and then something is somehow being set off against that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what Heidegger, if you read text of Heidegger outside being in time, because being in time is so totally vague and useless, pretty much, because almost everyone who reads it, uh, I mean, when I, you start when you start studying Heidegger, that's the first thing you read, and you understand almost you understand nothing, basically. You read the whole book, you understand nothing. So then, um, the only way you can understand any of it in a way is by looking at other things Heidegger has said, but actually by studying the tradition, because even the things that he says there, which are clear to people who they're only clear to people who have studied the matter themselves because um, if you've gone through Descartes and then if you've seen uh, how the science if you studied the sciences for a long time and seen uh, the development of modern uh, experimental science and how the fact concept uh, develops and how um, experimental science changes our vocabulary then you can kind of understand what he's talking about but that's only bringing your own knowledge to the text so that um, there's all these little summaries that are totally opaque unless you have the knowledge already to lay down on them uh, and you see that so you see that with this Bonavec reading which is why I think it's instructive because he's uh, attempting to use the knowledge he already has in order to explicate or interpret what he's reading in the text the text is says nothing unless we have uh, knowledge already. Um, what does Heidegger mean by consciousness? He's thinking in terms of... Um, Heidegger does not use Bewusstsein or consciousness to describe Dasein. Um, so that's one issue that, that can be uh, stated with um, exactitude so that we orient ourselves properly, at least from the orientation of starting from Kant, starting from the question of perception, starting from these um, questions which led, I mean, Descartes was asking these questions about how um, optics, optics, starting from optics, perception, um, how these uh, uh, phenomena happen. Once those questions are raised, then you can have a question, then you realize that the whole West was working in this um, tacit assumption that there's an object, reality, which is being um, experienced.
So the sense that um, the experience of a redwood tree, that doesn't mean that the redwood tree is having an experience, but it suggests that consciousness is uh, somehow leaping out and uh, acting, active, acting upon something, uh, something that's already there, a reality. Um, so in Kant, we get this... Uh, uh, taking it to the furthest, this problem of um, perception of sense of of a sense creature, which has to somehow go out and have its, um, in more Kantian language, um, the intuitions. Um, how does the formula go? Uh, concepts. Uh, without intuitions uh, are empty and intuitions without concepts are blind. Um, this play of the sense intuitions then being subsumed under a concept. A con uh, redwood tree is a concept. Um, uh, up and down are concepts under a, a scheme of intelligibility. This notion of um, some kind of raw data for the senses uh, being actively um, subsumed by the power of the so-called mind or the intelligibility is the background behind which then you get um, Hegel um, and thus Zizek's claims about the um, nature being blind. So again, the um, nature has no concepts, therefore it's blind. But on the other hand, blind is, a, is in a sense a concept, um, just as zero is in a sense a number. So we're still in that, when Zizek goes, says uh, nature is just this blind force, uh, the COVID viruses are these stupid things acting on their own, they're blind, blind nature moving forward. What he's saying is, it's not like a human being that has all these concepts by which we organize our experience so that we can say this is um, a sunny day and this is a, um, grass on the ground and um, these are human beings and et cetera, et cetera, that we, can, that we make the sense data somehow intelligible through this creative act, uh, since Kant is calling it a creative act of the um, intellig our intelligibility. Um, rather, there's also this other thing without the intelligibility called the blind, uh, blind nature, or however you want to call it. But this blindness itself is um, a kind of zero of the concept, which is clearly, um, if you really think about it, we're imagining something happening, um, which is in a way intelligible, just as the notion of nothing is in a way intelligible. So I think that's part of the background, which leads to Husserl and the phenomenology, this attempt to get out of that um, Kantian uh, schema of a, um, something that needs to reach out towards um, reality, but he still keeps the um, thing in itself in the place of the into, uh, the forms or the intelligibility um, that he has to reach. And then Heidegger uh, um, tries to set up Dasein as something that um, is more direct than that. But what I'm saying is, without going through all that stuff, thinking through all these um, thinkers that came before, Heidegger is kind of unintelligible, which is like, in other words, everybody just makes it up on their own. So the reading is just useless unless you have the knowledge already. So there's a kind of paradox in that. And we see it unfolding in different ways with different readers of different competence. So that's why I think it's, uh, that's why I'm going to continue with this sort of caravansary of, uh, these videos that he's putting out um, to see how uh, somebody who is more or less competent in philosophy in one sense, but who is not um, interested in Heidegger really, um, 
except in some vague sense, is interpreting the text, and it shows you how worthless the text is because it needs to, the text itself. Is, again, it's like uh, the saying about um, you know buying the book doesn't mean you buy the knowledge in the book. You have to know how to read it. You don't if you don't know the language. If you don't know um, the uh, mind of the one who wrote it. How, how can it get us anywhere? So there's a paradox in that. Um, and we should try to see uh, how much more um, one can bring to that text from focusing on uh, Prussian thinkers who were thinking with uh, the same world as Heidegger and had the same assumptions he did which are not uh, really shared in this, uh, I'll say, post-World uh, War II uh, dispensation of education. Um, but that question of what consciousness is supposed to indicate to us, what we're supposed to be thinking when we talk about consciousness, should come out maybe further as uh, he tries to... Um, move through the text and explain it to himself in simple terms. And I think what's especially interesting is he does, he has a great um, desire to explain things to himself in simple terms, in direct terms. That's somehow the personality of this um, uh, professor, such that uh, you kind of can see a contrast between that demand for immediate intelligibility and... Um, Heidegger's sense that in describing uh, the way things are, we may have to um, leave the primary vagueness there because that may be the way things um, things are. Um, that may be um, the dispensation that we're in such that we have to uh, wrestle with, we have to negotiate an existence with that rather than setting some uh, artificial clarity. Um, of course, you have this old saying about that you can get greater clarity in mathematics than you can um, in uh, discourse, but you have to try to get the uh, amount of clarity appropriate to the subject matter.